Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Empowering Access to Airborne and Field Data with NASA's KC Earth Data Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern time, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, what I'd like to do first is just begin today's webinar with a few logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, all participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A panel uh, rather than the chat, and you should see that located on the right side of your screen. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to the NASA Earth Data website as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a week of completion. Uh, once completed, what I'll do is I'll send an email to all of the registrants, and that will include a link to the recording as well as to the presentation slide deck that is going to be used within today's webinar. Uh, as far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and the demonstrations, and then a 15-minute Q&A period will follow. Depending on the volume of questions we receive, we may extend the Q&A session an additional 15 minutes from end time, um, but we will have a hard cutoff of 3.15 p.m. Okay, during today's webinar, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Camille Woods. She is a research associate at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, where she is a member of NASA's Interagency Implementation and Advanced Concepts Team, or IMPACT. She will begin today's webinar with an, let me actually pull up the agenda so you guys can take a look. All right, she's going to kick us off today with an introduction to NASA's Airborne Data Management Group and also NASA's catalog of archived suborbital Earth Science Investigations, or CASI. She will then discuss ADMG curation, the ADMG curation process, and then also delve a bit deeper into the CASI components and user interface. And then from this introduction, we will transition to this afternoon's second speaker, Eli Walker, who is an associate scientist with the University's Space Research Association and NASA Impact. Eli will provide a live demonstration of the key features and functionalities of CASI, showing you how you can find the airborne and field data information you need for your research or your applications. Uh, once Eli has finished with his demonstration, Camille will speak to the future state of Casey. And then finally, after our speakers have finished with their presentations, what we'll do then is we will transition to our optional final set of polling questions and then jump directly into the Q&A session. Um, I did want to provide just a really quick note about the Q&A session. We are going to try to answer all of the questions within the time allotted, but if we're not able to address your question during each of the, uh, uh, you know, during the webinar itself what, or during the extended Q&A, our speakers will be able to follow up with you offline. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Camille Woods. Camille, so let me stop sharing my screen and toss the presenter role to you. All right, Camille, you should have presenter uh, privileges at this point. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And good afternoon, everyone. Let's go ahead and jump into our presentation on NASA's Catalog of Archived Suborbital Earth Science Investigations, otherwise known as CASI and how it empowers as well as greatly improves our access to NASA's airborne and field investigation data. So as mentioned, I will lead us through the first portion of today's webinar, which is the presentation that I'm giving now. And my colleague, Eli Walker, will lead us through a live demonstration of the KC user interface here in just a bit. Both myself and Eli work with the Airborne Data Management Group that operates within the Interagency Implementation Advanced Concepts Team out of Marshall Space Flight Center here in Huntsville, Alabama. ADMG's primary goal is to focus on improving the discoverability, accessibility, and usability of NASA's airborne and field data holdings. For today's talk, we'll briefly touch on the origins of ADMG and Casey. We'll then segue into a discussion on how ADMG curates the metadata present within Casey, as well as highlight what makes Casey unique by delving into its various components. 
From there, we'll then discuss details on the KC user interface and conclude by demoing KC and taking a quick look ahead at the steps for its future. So, what exactly is KC? Well, KC includes a web based user interface that features detailed information and data access for NASA's airborne and field investigations via data product or DOI links. It also provides a plethora of contextual metadata for the campaigns, platforms, and instruments that are used to collect NASA's airborne and field data, which as we all know, is extremely important for the reuse of NASA data. Lastly, it allows us a variety of ways for users to search and browse through detailed information and links that direct users to additional authoritative sources. Sources such as published journal articles and campaign websites. And so I say all of that to say this. I personally like to consider Casey your one stop shop for many things pertaining to NASA's airborne and field campaigns. Now, before we move on. We invite you to either peruse Casey as we go through today's presentation, or we welcome you to follow along during our live demo by scanning the QR code you see on your screen. This may come as a surprise to some, but NASA doesn't just use satellites to collect information on our planet. In fact, NASA also uses mobile platforms such as planes like its ER-2 aircraft, the DC-8, and the C-130, as well as ships, balloons, and vehicles. NASA also uses stationary platforms such as ground sites to collect information near Earth's surface. It is these suborbital platforms that provide unique observations on a range of scales across many domains and disciplines that help scientists bridge the gap between how we see and understand Earth's physical processes from near the surface and how we're able to view and analyze them from space. Prior to the formation of AD&G in 2018, Individuals searching for information on NASA's airborne and field campaigns, as well as their associated data, had to sift through various websites, published journal articles, data repositories that potentially were not well maintained, and depending on how long ago the campaign occurred, some even had to pick the brains of the science teams that were involved in those campaigns. As a result, Casey was developed in order to help streamline what can at times be an arduous process by conducting a trustworthy assessment and synthesis of authoritative information pertaining to NASA campaigns that utilize suborbital platforms to help with this discovery and access. I cannot stress enough that Casey is more than just a web-based user interface. It essentially is a culmination of well-defined data models, automated quality checks, and it is a product of a very strict three-step metadata review process, which we'll cover on the next slide. As I just mentioned, any metadata that is entered into Casey's database must go through an intensive metadata curation process. In the first step, an individual from our curation team acts as a compiler and sifts through various authoritative sources to gather information. Once the first review is complete, the second reviewer confirms that the information gathered during the first review is accurate while taking a second pass at locating information that the compiler cannot find. The third and final review is conducted by an individual on our admin team. The admin ensures that the info gathered by the first two reviewers is as complete and accurate as possible before publishing the information to our database. The main takeaway here is that any metadata present on the KCUI is collected from authoritative sources and vetted by three reviewers before it is ever viewed by users on KC. 
More importantly, our curation process makes it so that users can easily locate information on Casey without having to spend hours looking through various sources on their own. So in simpler terms, we've essentially done the digging for you. Part of the metadata curation process also includes curating data products that are associated with the campaigns, platforms, and instruments in our inventory. For this process, code is run that matches the metadata in our inventory to the metadata present in the common metadata repository. From there, curators go through any matches that occur to either approve or deny the results, as well as make the appropriate associations. Similar to other metadata present in Casey, these matches also go through the three-step review and publication process before the data products and their associated DOI links appear on the Casey UI. One last step in metadata curation is ensuring that the most up-to-date global change master directory keywords a hierarchical set of controlled earth science vocabularies are present in the database. To ensure this, a semi-automated process synchronizes our local database to the current GCMD keyword master list. Any changes that are reflected are produced as drafts for a member of our admin team to either approve or deny, as well as note any associations in the database that need to be updated. All right, now let's jump into the components that make up KC. When we decided to build an inventory that would meet the needs of the airborne and field community, we knew that one of the first things we needed was a set of consistent terms. Prior to creating our list of terms, we witnessed the same entities being referred to by a variety of names, which at times led to utter confusion. That is why we found it extremely important for us to bring consistency to some of the most common terms by translating them to the ones we wanted to include in our list. The list of terms you see to the left is just a small subset of our initial terms before they went through a number of iterations and a thorough review that was conducted by the ESTA Standards Coordination Office. Now that we have a finalized list, which can be accessed by scanning the QR code on the screen, we have begun encouraging the use of our terms within the airborne and field community. Not only is having consistent terminology key to building a successful inventory, but we've also found it's extremely important to make consistent decisions when adding new information to Casey. We found the easiest way to do so is by creating decision trees that our entire team can utilize throughout the curation process. Some decision trees are simple and straightforward, like the one shown here, which is the decision tree a curator uses when deciding whether or not an entity is a new campaign that needs to be added or a new deployment of an existing campaign. On the other hand, some are more intricate and involved, like the one our curators use when determining if an instrument is a new one that needs to be added or an existing instrument that is referred to by a different name than the one that we have in our inventory, at which point we define it an alias. All in all, a major takeaway from this slide and the previous one is that consistency is key to maintaining objectivity while conducting our inventory activities. Another component of Casey is our conceptualized data model, which was created in concert with our inventory definitions. We canvas subject matter experts from various disciplines and backgrounds, so not just airborne, to identify what needs were not being met when trying to discover and access information pertaining to NASA's airborne and field campaigns. 
We also took an inventory of current tools that users can utilize to gain access to said information and noted the types of metadata we came across during our search. This allowed us to determine what gaps existed in information and data discovery, as well as feasible solutions to fix those gaps. It also allowed us to settle on the conceptualized data model that you see on the right hand side of your screen. Now, let's really delve into the nuts and bolts of Casey. At its core, Casey is an information knowledge center. As a result, Casey metadata are stored in a PostgreSQL relational database that's hosted on an Amazon Web Service relational database service instance. It is this setup that supports the content curation and approval process. The database, through the use of drafts, allows for objects to be created, updated, or deleted, and for the status to reflect where an object is in the curation process. It also allows for relationships between published objects to be easily established and called on at any time. For our database, all primary concepts are stored in tables while metadata tied to those concepts are stored in fields within those tables. And this is all depicted by the image you see on the right. The second major component of KC is the maintenance interface. Information entered into the MI is used to populate KC's database. Within the MI, curators can navigate to various forms in order to enter metadata that is collected as part of the curation process. An example is given here of an IOP form for one of the IOPs from the Spurs campaign. Once the form is completed and reviewed, it is then published to the database. Updates that need to be made to published forms can be done so via update drafts within the MI where differences between the published form and the updated form are tracked and highlighted in yellow, as you can see on the screen. The next major component of Casey is the user interface, a public facing website that allows users to sift through loads of contextual metadata on NASA's airborne and field campaigns and the platforms and instruments that are used for the campaign's data collection. KCUI's intricate design also allows users to make links between various entities by searching on facets such as NASA's Earth Science focus areas and the geophysical concepts that were developed by ADMG that may not be possible within other tools. In addition, KC provides direct access to data products via their DOI links, regardless of which data repository archives the data. All of this and more will be demonstrated momentarily, but for an early look into this powerful knowledge center, scan the QR code that is displayed on the screen. The final component of Casey are our well-documented public APIs, which allow users to programmatically access information published to Casey's database. Both the documentation and the APIs can be accessed by either visiting the URL you see on the screen or by scanning the provided QR code. So, why use Casey? At its core, Casey was built with all types of users in mind. From the most novice user who wants to learn more about a NASA aircraft they heard mentioned on the six o'clock news, to a subject matter expert who's participated in numerous field campaigns. Literally, anyone can use Casey. Additionally, I can't stress enough how easy it is to locate information for NASA's airborne and field campaigns. 
It's all literally right there at your fingertips, either via the KCUI or the public APIs. But perhaps more important than that is the loads of contextual metadata that exists within KC, regardless of the data repository that archives the data associated with it. Contextual metadata, metadata excuse me, in KC includes aliases for campaigns, platforms, and instruments, because as mentioned earlier, these entities can go by a variety of names within the airborne and field community. Contextual metadata also includes significant events. Quickly, by a show of hands, how many of you would rather spend hours sifting through data, looking for the exact time an observed phenomena occurred, rather than spending a few seconds looking through the timeline on Casey that tells you exactly when that event happened. I'm fairly certain if I could see everyone on the call right now, I wouldn't see any hands raised in favor of the first part of this scenario. So all in all, contextual metadata not only allows additional ways to search for info on Casey, but it provides information that may not be present within other tools, an important feature that sets Casey apart from others. As we get ready to take a closer look at the KCUI, there were a handful of goals that needed to be met before its full release this past July, including having information for more than 100 NASA-led campaigns, along with their associated platforms and instruments available in KC, the ability to search for those items using a free text field, as well as being able to browse data products with relative ease as shown on the screen. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to my colleague Eli, who's gonna walk us through an in-depth demonstration of the KCUI. I've again provided Casey's QR code for those who would like to follow along with the demo. And with that, Eli, the floor is yours. Thank you, Camille. And hello, everyone. Today, I'll be demoing for you all the functionality and capabilities of Casey. So what you're currently seeing right here is a general layout of the Casey homepage. There are many components that make up Casey, which are beneficial to new and returning users. The first component is this explore button right here. Clicking on this button will direct users to another page where they can conduct a detailed search query for contextual metadata elements or data products. This functionality is useful to users who would like to conduct a broad or narrow search. Then below the explore button is a simple search bar. This allows for users to quickly streamline suborbital information by entering the name of a campaign like Listos or a platform like the P3 or an instrument like X-Band Radar. Then the final components at the bottom allow for users to quickly browse related metadata topics to find suborbital information. Now that we have viewed the homepage, we can start our data discovery journey. Like I mentioned before, once we click on the explore button, it takes us to a detailed search query page. Here at the top, there are search categories based upon different Casey metadata views, which are campaigns, platforms, instruments, and a data products view. Each view contains their own search bar with different filtering options. For example, the campaign search bar allows for users to select the date range of the study, its focus area, 
the geographical region that the study was conducted in or the platform that was implemented during the study. Then if we click on the platforms tab, we can see that the search bar has changed and now users can filter just by the name of the platform or the utilized instruments. There's also a list below of platform types and once we click on it, it organizes the list below based upon our selection. Then the same concept applies for the instruments category, but we can filter by the measurement type, which means what type of instrument, measurement style, if the instrument is in situ, remote, or passive, or the vertical region, which is the column of observation below or above. Now let's conduct a simple search. Let's say that I'm an atmospheric aerosols researcher and modeler. I'd like to use Casey to find observational field data to use for assessing simulated aerosol parameters of pollution events. These can be from any area, but I need to have in situ data of the aerosols for evaluating my model's output. First thing that I would do is click on the geophysical concepts, which reveals a drop down list of different options, and then select aerosols. When we select aerosols, we can now see that the list has changed displaying all the campaigns related to aerosol studies. And we then can go into a campaign and find the in situ data. Now let's conduct a more detailed search. Let's say that I'm a scientist that studies sea ice and glacial processes from satellites, but I'm not a frequent user of suborbital data. I'd like to see what observations NASA has made from non-satellite platforms and determine if any of these provide ice topography data. The first thing I would do is select the geographical region to be polar or sea ice. And then I select the geophysical concept to be ice and glacial properties. Now the list shows the result from our multi-field search, which resulted in displaying all, all the studies that were related to glacial and ice or those conducted in polar regions. And this functionality works the same for the platform and instruments tab, but let's conduct a query search using different metadata fields. We can use instruments as an example. Now let's say that I'm a precipitation scientist and would like to use Casey to find airborne radar observations of precipitation. First, I would select the measurement type to be radar. And then I'd select the vertical measurement region to be troposphere. Now we can see all the instruments that meet our search criteria. Let's say that I'm a case user that does not want to view informational metadata, but would just like to find data products. What we would do is go to the data products view. Then could search based upon a measurement variable, which is a key feature of Casey. Measurement variables are a synced list of NASA GCMD keywords allowing users to select data products based upon a selected term or category. If we search, for example, LIDAR, which is a GCMD category, and select it, it provides all the products that contain LIDAR data. Now, if a user struggles to find a keyword, they can click on this information button here which takes them, to, takes them to the GCMD keyword website where they can find measurement variables. It is very important to inform you all that not every data product is currently on KC. ADMG curators are still working very hard to curate NASA's suborbital campaigns, platforms, instruments, and data products. So far, you have seen two major components of the KC UI the homepage that guides users across the website, and the Explore page, which benefits any type of user, new or returning, by streamlining contextual metadata, suborbital information, and the corresponding data products. Now, 
Let's take a look at another important capability of Casey by selecting a specific metadata page. So let's search for FireX AQ. When we select a metadata entry, it takes us to its own page. Here we have selected the joint NASA and NOAA campaign, FireX AQ, which observed atmospheric composition and weather across the North American region, which is indicated in the spatial bounding box. If we scroll down, we can see the overview information of the campaign, such as the description, the start and end dates, the season of study that the campaign was conducted in. Users can also follow links to the campaign's DOI, its overview websites, or the DAC repository who stewards the campaign's data. Going further, we get a deeper view of the campaign's information and users can browse by the focus area, geophysical concepts, and focus phenomena. We can also click through different uh, platforms that were utilized during the campaign and see all the instrument payloads that were on board. Then ADNG developers have produced an interactive timeline that can break down platform deployments into a detailed view of when the intensive operational period was conducted, along with any significant events that happened. For example, during the FireX AQ campaign, researchers flew the DC-8 through smoky skies to study the chemistry and plume evolution of the Castle Fire in northern Arizona. Finally, Users can access the campaign's corresponding data products by following these links, which directly takes them to the DAC websites. Unfortunately, this is not loading, but what you would see is the atmospheric science data, data website where users can go in and directly download the corresponding data products. You can also filter out data products on campaign pages by the utilized platform or the instrument that collected the data. Now let's view how all information in KC cross-references other linked metadata pages throughout the website. If I am unsure about a platform such as the Jetliner Douglas DC-8, I then can click on it and Casey will bring me to its own page where I can access the platform's information. Then users can scroll down to see uh, any campaign that utilizes this particular platform or any recorded data product that is currently on Casey. If we select another campaign like Olympex and scroll down to the platform section, We can see the Douglas DC-8, or we can select an instrument such as the Microwave Atmospheric Sounder for CubeSat. And if we click on Learn More, it will take us to the Instruments page. And once again, you can see the Douglas DC-8 and the Olympex campaign, which cycles us back to connected information we view. This introduces the cross-reference information in KC and the abil ability for rabbit hole searching. Finally, if users have any general questions, questions about terms, or would like to know more information, they can access the glossary page here at the top or the frequently asked questions page. They could also reach out to the ADMG team for help or to share how we can improve the KC website. Please do not hesitate to ask questions or reach out. So that concludes our demo. I will now hand the floor back to you, Camille. Thank you so much for that demonstration, Eli. 
As we conclude, it's important to note that we've only put a dent in the list of known NASA airborne and field campaigns, which means there's much more work to do. That also means to check back often if there's an item missing that you feel should be present on Casey, as we're continuously adding new information and features. We're also looking forward to Casey becoming a cornerstone piece of the forthcoming Airborne and Field Data Resource Center, as well as its eventual transition to ESBIS. Lastly, we invite you to learn more about Casey and the other work ADNG is doing, such as our historical data recovery efforts at the upcoming AGU and AMS conferences. that, we'd now like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their major contributions to Casey, including our curators, otherwise known as our ADMG All-Stars, as well as our wonderful developers within Impact and DevSeed. We also invite you to contact our team at ADMG at UAH.edu for follow-up discussions on today's webinar and or to leave feedback on Casey, which can be accessed via the link on the screen. As you now know, collecting information on hundreds of NASA airborne and field campaigns is a huge undertaking. So please do contact us if you come across something that you feel is missing from Casey or is inaccurate. As Eli mentioned, we welcome any and all feedback. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. With that being said, thank you so much for your time and attendance today, and we'll hand things back over to you, Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Camille. So right now, I am just scanning to see we're going to um, leave the optional polls open for like 30 minutes or so, and I am looking to see whether or not there are any questions. So, so I actually have a question, um, and that is... Uh, no, we should have a new poll that's opened here. Can you all see the um, can you all see the end poll? You should be able to. If you could type into the um, type into the. Uh, Okay, so here is a uh, our first question, and then I'll ask my question. How does Casey use drafts? Are they UMMC or CMR compliant metadata? Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Sure. So the question is. The question is, how does Casey use drafts? Are they UMMC CMR compliant metadata? That is a really good question. And it's Stephanie, were you about to step in? Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope I hope y'all can hear me. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. So we use the drafts as essentially the, the, the way of maintaining objects within the database. And they are not um, per se uh, really part of UMMC or CMR in and of itself. A lot of the elements that exist within Casey's um, essentially schema um, do um, map very nicely over to items within CMR um, or from UMMC, uh, but they're not. They're not always. Uh, they don't. Not all of the Casey elements map directly to uh, CMR elements. So. In instances where they do, uh, our um, Camille mentioned the, the initial script that will provide suggestions, um, but ultimately those go through the curation process before they're approved in the draft. So, but yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. The next question is, uh, when should a user use Casey to explore airborne data versus Earth data search? Um, honestly, with Earth Data Search being a great tool, I do feel like Casey should be your first go to because whereas Earth Data Search includes a lot of satellite data holdings, it could take you quite a bit of time to get to the airborne and field data that you're trying to get to. 
Casey, on the hand, will directly get you to what you need to get to a lot quicker, in my opinion. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Camille. So the next question is, uh, can you talk more about the ADMG and CMR metadata reconciliation process? Are there DACs involved in that process? Stephanie, it's, would you like to take yeah, that one? It's not, it's not really a reconciliation. Um, it, cause we're not, we're not modifying anything that is in CMR when we populate Casey. Um, not, not modifying anything in CMR directly. We may start with elements, the content of which are from CMR and then we may make adjustments, um, but it, that's more of refining it to fit the definitions for specific elements within the Casey schema. Um, our our metadata are completely separate from CMRs right right now, so we're not changing anything in CMR in doing this. Um, and at the moment, the DACs are not populating the metadata that are in Casey. That's done entirely by the ADMG curators. Okay, and so I'll just also add to the previous question, um, sort of looking at KC versus using Earth Data Search. Um, I agree with with Camille's answer. You know, there's NASA's got uh, gobs and gobs of Earth observations, and the vast majority of those are from satellites. And so, when you're looking in a tool like Earth Data Search, those are naturally going to be what you tend to to encounter. Um, so not only is it you're looking if you're looking for airborne or field data, it's it's a small slice of that giant pie, right? Um, but there's also really important contextual things about um, the motivations for for those data collection uh, efforts, even what other instrumentation were on the same platform when that data were collected. So y'all saw in Eli's demo that you can see you know, the, the payload for a particular aircraft or ground platform, what other instruments were also um, operating in concert with that for that particular field campaign, that really can lend to lead to more synergistic analysis activities where you're able to see what other data um, can complement the observations from the exact same time and place. Um, and unlike satellites, those payloads on those, um, or the instrument, um, packages on those platforms can evolve, right? You aren't, you know, you might change out what is available on one aircraft or what is at one field site uh, versus another over the course of, you know, multiple campaigns. So having that all readily available um, really promotes the more appropriate and more involved reuse of the data, uh, particularly for some of these more in-depth analysis. Well, thank you, Stephanie. So at this point, I'm going to actually hop up to the chat because there are a, a few questions here. Um, so, and then I'll skip back down to the Q&A. I just don't want to leave out any of the questions. So the first one is, although I do think it appears also in the Q&A. So looking at Casey's website, it does include weather meteorological data. I am aware Hurricane Hunters is NOAA, but in the future, would Casey potentially host Hurricane Hunters flight data? I can't find the raw data anywhere, not including the daily text files. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, with uh, my my own background uh, and initial work being in in you know tropical meteorology area, I, I I love this question and I wish I had a better answer. But the the funding and the source for everything for Casey's development has been to focus and our our directive really was to focus on NASA observations. So. Unfortunately, the NOAA data are not within our purview, so we're really not allowed to to you know, dictate anything there. Um, what we are hoping and, and, and gearing things towards within ADMG are encouraging the sort of data practices that um, exist within ESDIS uh, for data um, stewardship and then how ADMG is working to improve some of those in the context of airborne and field data. Uh, we do uh, reach out and we do communicate with our partners over in, um, like in uh, the, 
companies that the AOC folks that operate the NOAA, the NOAA planes and the NOAA um, aircraft, but we can't, we don't have the um, power to, to really pull them in just yet. Um, KC was really funded as a NASA, NASA oriented effort. So we've only focused on that thus far. Okay, well, thank you so much, Stephanie. So the next question, again, from the chat, there's a couple more, um, is how does Casey deal with ground-based measurements that collect observations on a continuous basis rather than a campaign basis? So we do classify those as separate kinds of platforms. Uh, we have a metadata item in Casey that describes a platform's type and that uh, in, in this exact scenario, uh, we would classify more of an operational uh, item. So a, a radar that continuously operates, that would be considered a permanent land site that's operating all of the time. Whereas our field sites or our campaign field sites are more temporary in nature. They may be set up for um, really however long the um, duration of the campaign or duration of an, of an IOP or deployment uh, that, that that site has been set up for. So uh, we have entirely separate um, platform type categories for this exact reason. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the next question is, is there a way to overlap an Earth Data Search and Casey for validation? That should, uh, let's see, that that might be doable now. And we just have started um, we're in the very early stages co coordinating some things with our ESDIS colleagues uh, and how we might, you know, kind of looking at the future of Casey and where it would go next. And one of the first things that we set up was having uh, something called the UMM, a tool record so that the DACs are able to do things like smart handoffs between Casey as well as other DAC developed tools. Um, so I haven't really looked at doing this exact thing, but I do know that the groundwork and like the, the technical need to, to make that feasible um, has is, is, is getting laid. So I, I think if I'm understanding your question right, that that's what I'm getting at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So I'm just scanning to see whether or not there are any additional questions here. Um, let me go back to the chat and just double check there as well. Okay. So one of the questions I actually had is, and this might, I, I might know the answer to this. I don't think I have noticed within Casey like a, um, you know, a specific filtering for just the flight reports. Uh, is it the flight reports are included if they are part of the data set documentation within each of the campaigns? Is that how that works? At the moment, yeah. We, okay. we do have a number of, like, continuing on um, things to, to add in to Casey, and some of those details um, are, are some of the sort of, you know, more readily Yes, prominent on the UI links that that would be showing, um, as well as like flight tracks and platform location maps for each of the um, for each of the IOPs and for each of the deployments. Um, there are often um, Eli did a great um, did a, a good uh, kind of teaser teaser look at the timeline section on the campaign pages, uh, and a number of times where those uh, significant events or deployment or particular. Uh, time periods of note that have been um, highlighted in certain campaign and flight reports, those details are often included on those significant event items. So if you click through a timeline for a, a particular campaign, you would find those kind of things in there. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. And just, um, I wanted to, I know that several people noted this in the um, in the chat, but if you cannot see the polling questions, there should be three dots in the bottom. I believe it's on the right side of your screen for participants. And if you select uh, the three dots, you should be able to, um, you know, insert a check mark next to both the chat, the Q and A, and also the polls. So within WebEx webinars, all of the panels open you know, on the right side of the screen, although I think there's a capability to kind of 
push them out, um, pop them out as a panel as well. But I just wanted to make that note. And we really do appreciate your feedback here. So thank you. Um, the polling question feedback is really instrumental in determining future webinar topics and really identifying where there could be user user gaps, just in terms of what we're providing and maybe what was not provided that you need. So I don't see any additional questions in the q and I'm going to check the chat again. Um, okay, let's see. Here is a question. Thank you very much. So the next question is, how far back in time do you plan to go? I know at least for the ER2, there are missions that date back to the 1980s. Yes, yeah, so we don't uh, necessarily, as far as I know, have a cutoff on time frame. In fact, some of the campaigns that we have curated uh, have gone back as far as the early 90s, if not sooner or later than that. Yeah, our, our, our task was to complete an inventory of all of NASA's data. So we are still working on that, or airborne and field data. So we are still working on that effort. So yeah, we, we're not, you know, we're not done. Um, ideally, we'd like to get to all of it. So if it was funded, we'd like to get there. But we do know, um, and this is another kind of arena of ADMG's ongoing work besides Casey, but it definitely um, overlaps with Casey. Uh, and that's our data rescue efforts. So these are observations that were funded by NASA and have not yet been properly stewarded or properly um, archived at a DAC. Uh, and so we are, you know, we're, we're going through and finding in some cases physical records of either airborne field data um, and then shepherding them through the DAC assignment and um, archival process. So eventually those would be visible as well. So. Okay, thank you to Camille and also to Stephanie. So there is another question here. Just bear with me here. Is it reasonable to consider an extension to a CMR, UMMC, or other UMM schema to include some of the unique aspects of the KC metadata? Uh, I'm sorry. I think if somebody's looking at it at the same time I am, it looks like it just... Uh, okay, so the unique aspects of the KC metadata schema, the campaign deployment terminology that KC developed now on the ESCO website is very helpful, and I think this could be a useful extension to CMR. So there are, you know, several parts to that if you'd like me to go through it again, or if you are fine with that, we can. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for this. This is, it's like you're already anticipating some of what we are actively uh, working towards now. So we're in uh, many conversations um, with uh, some of the, the CMR architects and, and others uh, on basically exactly that um, and how to best not necessarily merge the two, but how to have them complement each other and what the next steps would be so that the kinds of metadata that we're using in KC that the, the folks from these airborne and field science communities um, are able to to use those effectively across the whole of ESDIS ecosystem and not just within one context of KC. So um, we're we're looking at doing that. We're looking at um, kind of what sort of architecture would be most effective, most um, um, e implementable, um, and all of those sort of concerns. But uh, I'm I'm really happy to to hear of the interest and um, would love to uh, potentially share some of those discussions uh, if you're interested in, in in keeping that moving forward. Okay, thank you again. So, okay, so the next question is, and maybe you could just confirm, I feel like you might have addressed this a bit earlier. Um, is there a way to, is there currently a way to search both Casey and Earth data for Earth data search for overlap? Or could you just um, repeat your response? Sorry, I was typing. Um, Sorry, can you repeat what, what you're asking? Sure. So is there a way to search both KC and Earth Data Search for overlap? Yeah, I mean you could you could perform some of the same kinds of queries on, on either. Uh, I would just be uh, wary of um, 
for example, if you type an Earth Data search, if you search on a particular field campaign name, um, the way that that's set up is you will get content from like your results will include things that have that field campaign name anywhere. So it could be a, a campaign that occurred later that references the campaign you're searching for as perhaps a motivator saying, you know, we had this campaign occur um, at one point in time and they had these observations. So now we're conducting a new campaign. So you, your results may be a little bit more broad than what you're actually targeting. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's that's actually very good. That's what you're what you're looking for. Uh, but if you're looking for a particular event from one of those campaigns and you're trying to get to data products from that key time period, um, the case uh, and doing that in, in Earth Data Search would kind of give you more of that haystack to sift through. Whereas in Casey, you would be able to narrow down to that particular event much easier. Um, another thing that I think I mentioned, um, we do have the feasibility now in place uh, for being able to do smart handoffs between the between Casey and other, and other entities. Uh, and other like DAC developed tools, for instance, and that would be one way to do a bit more of a one to one comparison. Um, but, you know, we could talk more offline about some of the details there. If you wanted to have like a particular example, we could go through that. That actually could be really helpful for us um, for understanding some of the, the result list compared to what you're getting in Earth Data Search. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. So the next question is, and I think this, I, I know the acronym for this, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it correctly. Okay, so one of the most impactful sets of NASA ground data is from the AgAge or is it AgAge network? Are AgAge net data available on KC? So is this the advanced global atmospheric gases experiment for this particular okay. user? That's my assumption of what they mean. I, yes. I don't okay. Know. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie. So I just yeah, did a quick you. search and it looks like we do not have that information in our database as of yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that we won't at some point in the future. Um, so as yeah. Eli mentioned, oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, no, Camille, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm just saying, you know, we do have our ongoing curation and that we have a whole team of folks that are doing this. So, um, whether it's a campaign, a particular platform or network of platforms um, that doesn't, if it's not visible there, that doesn't mean we aren't aware of it and aren't working through it, but we can certainly add this as one that we can prioritize based on your input here today. So, um, yeah, I understand, mon yes, monitoring station, but this would be something that we would consider more of a permanent site alluding to the previous question as well. So it's something that is useful for airborne and field efforts that may not have been tied to a just a shorter ter duration campaign. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so not seeing any additional questions in the chat. Uh, let's see here. Just kind of take a look back down at the Q and A. All right. If there are no further questions, and I will give it a minute. Again, we appreciate your feedback on the polls. Um, we will leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so, and uh, but we will log off from the audio component if there are no further questions. So if you think of something, um, please feel free to type that into the chat or into the Q&A because I will send the, um, the logs to our speakers and panelists so they can, you know, address those questions offline with you. All right, so let me do one more check. I don't think I've missed any. I think that might do it. So with that, I would like to thank all of our participants for joining us this afternoon um, and to thank Stephanie Wingo, who is the Airborne Data Management Group team lead uh, for participating as a Q&A panelist. And then also to thank Camille Woods and Eli Walker, our speakers for this afternoon's event. Um, I hope to have the uh, recording, you know, ready uh, to go, hopefully by the end of the day on Friday, since we've got at least in the States a holiday weekend, but if not, certainly um, by Monday. 
And when I do that, I'll send a link to all registrants. So if you have any colleagues who were not able to make it, um, I will send a link to the presentation slide deck as well as to the recording. So with that, uh, any final comments from our speakers or um, Q&A panelists? And if not, we will log off from the audio component and uh, leave the virtual space open for a bit. We'd just like to thank everyone for calling in again today. And thank you, Jennifer, for executing all of this so flawlessly. We really appreciate all of your help with this process. Yes, thank you all. Well, you're very welcome. Well, thanks so much, everybody. At this point, we'll log off from the audio component. And uh, we hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. All right, take care, everybody. All right, goodbye now.